Welcome back to another episode of the Royals Farm Report podcast. My name is Alex Duvall, and I am addicted to bad baseball. I am jo- joined tonight by Joel for this therapy session. Um, Joel, welcome to Royals Addicts Anonymous. <laughs> Anonymous. Yeah. Hi, hi. my name is Joel, and I'm addicted to bad baseball. <laughs> Josh, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Josh, and I am impartial and uh, just kind of neutral to bad baseball. I'm angry at bad baseball. <laughs> I'm, there, I'm, there's a certain level of masochism that is involved with being a Royals <laughs> fan, if we're being honest. You have to. It is yeah. Yeah. like apathy. Just we're going to we're. I am so apathetic to the Royals right now. We're going to jump immediately into our sponsor. From the beginning, we knew right away that we want to do strength conditioning and a throwing program for the baseball and softball community. It wasn't something we were trying to back into or all of a sudden learn. We knew we were really good at these coaching these skills from the get-go. And the fact that we're in the same business and the employees are all on the same page, you know, we can write a program based off of what a kid needs, not just getting him stronger or faster from a general sense. It's what does this kid need? On the pitching end, we can say, hey, this kid needs such and such. He needs to do this or that better. A lot of times it, turns out it's not something that needs to be fixed in the baseball cage or on the throwing mat. It actually needs to be fixed in the weight room. All right. Thanks to KCSE for picking up the podcast this year, our title sponsor for the show, Kansas City Strength and Conditioning out at Home Field, Nolatha. So thank you again very much to them. Gentlemen, we're going to do something different today. We are going to, we're going to play a game. And we're just gonna have some fun with it because somebody's gotta somebody has to bring the fun. Um, <laughs> it was my favorite thing, I think, on social media during like the Chiefs run was Kent Swanson and the gang. Hashtag establish the fun because <laughs> that is that is what we're gonna do. We are going to establish the fun in the Royals Nation right here tonight with a little round of two truths and a lie. So mm. I'm gonna go first because I said so. And basically what it's going to be is three fictitious things. So they're all, they're all hyper. They're not hyperbole. They are all foreshadowing. They are all futuristic things that nobody could actually know about. And you guys are going to tell me what are the two truths and what is the lie predicting the future of Royals baseball or Royals prospect minor league baseball. So, I'm going to go first. I'll lay the groundwork, and you guys, you tell me what the two truths and a lie are. So I've got, whenever Vinny Pasquantino does get called up, his major league on-base percentage will be at least 340 on September 1st. MJ Melendez will have 12, at least 12, big league home runs by September 1st. And Bobby Witt Jr. will have 25 stolen bases by September 1st. What are the two truths? What is the lie for this round? I'm locked in. Hit me. Uh, It's far and away, I think it's the far and away, the MJ Melendez and Bobby Witt Jr. We don't know what Vinny's going to do up at the major league level. We think it's going to be good. He's All signs are indicated that he is. All three of us are huge Pasquantino believers. Uh, Pasquant believers? I don't know. There's nothing not there. But – Melendez has the power. He's already got two. Uh, Bobby's already gotten multiple stolen bases. He's got the skill to do it. I think he's proven that he can get on base now. I think the rookie of the year campaign starts started like a week ago. Let's say that. Uh, so I think those are the two uh, two truths. So the the lie for Josh is that Vinny Pasquantino have an on base of three forty in the big leagues. Joel hit me. Yeah, uh, just for the sake of being different, I'll go with I think Vinny is going to have an OBP of 340 or better. His uh, his approach is too advanced for him not to, I think. Uh, he showed in the little bit of time he had in big league camp that he can work a really good at bat and is willing to take a walk. So I, I'll go with that. And then I do think Bobby is going to get uh, 25 stolen bases. I'm. It's not that I don't think MJ can get 12. He certainly can. Uh, but we're getting to that point now where there's enough of a book out on him where pitchers are able to attack a little more. You're starting to see pitchers attack him more at the top of the zone, and the strikeouts are coming a little bit more for him. So I think there is going to be a little bit of an adjustment period. The power might be zapped for six weeks or so, uh, but 
the more likely to me is Vinny and Bobby in this scenario. I like that. And I like the reasoning for both because I agree with both of you. I think MJ has certainly shown us the capability to get to 12. And if he gets the playing time, I actually think that's the safest one on here if they Mm. allow him to play every day. But with Salvi coming back, you don't know what's going to happen with Cam Gallagher. Um, Joel, I agree with the, with the caveat there that maybe it isn't MJ, even though he is completely capable. Um, The second one I've got for you guys is a little bit different. So two truths and a lie. Scott Barlow plays for the Royals on September 1st. Zach Granke plays for the Royals on September 1st. Carlos Santana plays for the Royals on, or I'm sorry, these are all August 1st, right after the trade deadline. So yeah, yeah. Scott Barlow, Zach Granke, Carlos Santana play for the Royals on August 1st. Joe, you want to lead off this time? Sure. Barlow and Grinky are still going to be on the Royals. Carl Santana will not be. I think that's the easiest answer. Now, I think if Barlow's fastball wasn't 92, maybe you're looking at being able to trade him, but I do think there are some red flags that are kind of popping up with him a little bit. I don't think he's going to be bad. I don't think he's going to take this horrible turn. Certainly is in a bit of a funk right now, but I think the Royals are going to try and keep that bullpen together. It's still very cost-controlled. Probably still believe that the next time they're actually decent, maybe this bullpen will come together and solidify a little more. I think just for fan service reasons, they're going to keep Grinky around. And I just, I, as much as I know the Royals want to say, we're paying Carl Santana to be our first baseman, he's been awful. So at a certain point, you got to make that move. And I don't think he's going to be on this team, hell, by July 1st. I completely agree. I think, you know, Barlow has shown that, you know, the cost controlled, he can be effective. And if anything we've learned from Dayton Moore is he does not like to deal relievers when he's supposed to or when it's most apt. So I think Barlow will 100% be a Royal for the, at least the rest of this year. Grinky will 100% be on this team for at least the rest of the year. It sounded like when he made his deal, Kansas City was where he wanted to be. There was no talk about like – I mean, there was no rumors, no nothing about him potentially being – dealt at the trade deadline type of thing. So I think Grinky 100% be on this roster, if not next year and the year before that, I could totally see and be this being like a two, three year stint for Grinky. So um, I think Grinky and Barlow is definitely the choice. And I mean, they've, they've shown the capacity to move on from guys, even if they are paying him uh, Omar Infante DFA, uh, Lucas Duda DFA, not necessarily the same situation, but you know what I'm saying? Like, They don't move on for guys unless it's absolutely the last case scenario. There's nothing to be had, nothing to be gained from keeping on this roster. So I think Carlos Santana will be gone before this other two. Let me throw you a curveball then real quick. I'm going to cheat a little bit. If I replaced Santana with Benintendi in this game, Mm, and I'm assuming we all think he's getting traded. So of the two pitchers, who do you think is most likely to be gone? Just real quick. Grinky. Grinky makes the most sense, yeah. I don't. I don't see because Barlow has what three years after this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Royals wouldn't trade him for that. See, I actually think you're right in your assessment of who will be. I actually think Scott Barlow is your best trade asset. Like well, he I is, for sure. but does, he is. But does that mean they're going to trade him? Because how often have they traded their best trade asset? Right. No, that is <laughs> that is one thousand percent correct, and that is the thing. Like I would, I would rather like with the way the rotation's been. I would just assume keep Granky all year because I think yeah. the value he brings eating innings for two months Absolutely. and just being in the locker room is more valuable than whatever you're going to get for him in a trade unless yep. he is just dealing leading up to the trade deadline. And starters sometimes do bring back a haul. But, okay, uh, Josh, go ahead. Let's hit, see your two truths and a lie. Okay, so I got kind of a similar deal. But by the end of the year, the one, the Royals will lead the AL in total rookie F war. Okay. Number two, the Royals will lose 100 plus games this season. Number three, Mike Matheny finishes the year as the manager. Mm. That's a good one. Um, I'm trying to think of other teams with a lot of good rookies. Mm -hmm. I will maybe one really good one. I will say the lie is that the Royals lose 100 games. That's yeah, I I'm think Mike Matheny finishes the season with the Royals. Uh, it would have to get abysmal. Like I, I will say, the the 100 loss thing and the Mike Matheny thing cannot coexist. Yeah, one or the other will will break. Yeah. Um, so I will say that 
the 100 losses is a lie. I think this team finds a way to scrape across uh, 70 wins, 70 and 92-ish. I think they're too talented. I actually wrote about it in the minutes this morning that they're actually doing some good things. The last two mm-hmm. weeks, they're over. They're averaging over four and a half runs per game. The rotation is semi-formidable all of a sudden. The bullpen, as bad as it's been the last two Sundays, from Monday to Saturday, they're just all they're doing is observing the Sabbath. And and I don't blame them for taking <laughs> Sundays off. So I think Dayton Moore actually probably applauds them for for observing the Sabbath. So Taylor Clark just he called in sick on Sunday. He's like, I'm uh-huh. not pitching. If you want me to pitch, I'm not going to get anybody out. And the Royals said, that's fine. That's very yep. on brand. Anyway, but yeah, I'll say the <laughs> the 100 losses is the lie. I actually think there's a good chance they lead the American League in rookie F4. That's that's a good one. Okay. Joe, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, I, I the have the same, same sentiment. I don't think that they lose 100 games. Uh, but if they do lose 100 games, Mike Matheny's gone. So I think, like Alex said, I, I'm kind of along the same vein here. And I do think they have a chance to lead in rookie F4, especially if you get – I mean, it also helps when you can have five, six rookies you throw out there. Certainly yeah. that helps your odds. But especially yeah. when you have six rookies that are all net po- – probably all at least four of them are going to be net positive. Yeah. I think there's a pretty good chance there. And I think the the catch there is the bullpen arms. They're kind of – I mean, they're not contributing much to that, but they are at the moment not necessarily contributing to anything either. So – uh, it will go up. Currently, there are fifth in the AL in uh, F4 at 0.6 behind Houston because of Jeremy Pena, obviously. Uh, Minnesota has a bunch of good rookies. Oakland is nothing but rookies. And same with Baltimore, who's 0.8. So currently fifth in F4 currently. And they're on pace to go 57 and 105. So take that for take that for what you want, but it does seem like Alex, to your point about like the bullpen kind of starting to take things off. Doesn't it seem like every year around this time we're talking about you know the offense is slow to start, rotation is slow to start, but the bullpen and defense are usually hitting banging on all cylinders early, and then one of those takes a step forward and the other takes a step back. It seems like it's clockwork every June first, late May clockwork every year. It's always like that. So whatever, but. It just seems like that to me, maybe. Um, next one. Going by the MLB pipeline rankings. So okay. already, already there. Uh, by the end of the season, the Royals farm system will have blank prospects in their system with a 50 or higher overall grade from MLB pipeline. Five or more, six or more, or seven or more. Currently, they are at seven with Melendez, Prado, Lacey, Vinny, Lofton, Mazzucato, and Bolin. Obviously, there's going to be some graduations. Obviously, there's going to be some additions. What do you think? By the end of the year, where are they at? Five, six, or seven, or more? Nick Lofton, Asa Lacey, John Bolin, two draft picks. Mazzucato. I'll go go with seven. I'll say seven or more. I will. So you I'll, say I'll there's two it. lies there. I'm sorry. Five wait, and there's two lies. Oh, yeah. oh so five, six, five or seven more or, the or other six two. or more. Five or more, five six, or more, or six or more, or seven or more. So I think the, the basically the over under is at six, five and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So the two truths. Oh, wait, so wait, where's the lie? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is a little so tricky. The lie would be, so the lie would be five or more. Is that where you're at? Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds like. So they'll have at least six, and they'll have at least seven. Well, I guess they'll have five too. This is a bad one, but we can. Just I see what you're getting on. at, though. Yeah, no, I see what you're getting at. <laughs> the lie I will say is that they'll have less than six. So if yeah, you want to set the line okay. at five and a half, the lie is that they will have less than six. They're definitely going to have six. I think yep. Lofton, Lacey, Bolin, Mazzucato, Kaderna are locks, and then you need one of your two draft picks. I mean, if they draft. If they get Gavin Cross, he's at least a 55. Like that is you're guaranteed six right there. So I will yep. I will say at least six. I'll I'll even give him seven. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking along the same vein. You no, know, like kind of similar names, but I think Ben Kuderna has a chance. Is he already a 50? No. Or is he 45? Not that I saw. It might have changed. Now we'll talk. I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit, but if he's throwing that change up, he's gonna be a 50 here very soon. <sighs> That changeup was so good. Gross. That was so. 
he had yeah. nothing like that. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh-uh. You're right. We'll yeah, but that that's my caveat here is I think that that's going to be the guy that gets in. Uh, at least one draft pick for sure is going to be a 50 or higher, possibly the second, depends on where they decide to go with the money mm-hmm. uh, aspect of it. But I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, Good. I would say that's probably right. It makes sense not only because Pipeline's pretty generous with their with their 50s. Uh, that's one thing. But yeah, it, it does seem like now Melendez and Prado graduating. We probably don't see a Lacey call up. Vinny probably graduates. At least yeah, we maybe. hope. I would think <laughs> so that Lacey Lofton, Mazzucato, Bolin, Kuderna is five plus the two draft picks makes sense. Seven or more is pretty easy. I should have set this way higher. So, Hey, we're well, still no, in it's, good it's not a guarantee because uh, think about, right. Think about Kuderna in not, I mean, he was our second pick and not a 45. So depending on where they go in the draft, if they go best available, I think it's an easy seven. If they decide to under slot a couple guys, yeah. then it won't necessarily be uh, be a lock. I just think in this particular draft cycle, they will go best available. I'm gonna double check because I know, I know that Pipeline did update their top 100. So I just want I do want to double check on the Kuderna. Kuderna is a five. Yeah, he's a 50 as well. Oh, there you go. Yep. So that's yeah. Well, I thought Heasley. They got Heasley at a 45 overall, but Kuderna is under him at a 50. All right. They probably then. recently redid their grades and haven't touched the mm. rankings yet. That makes sense. So they currently have eight guys at 50 or above. So, yeah, definitely Very messed cool. up the line there. But whatever. We got to talk about it. Joel, Joel. go ahead. Hit us. Okay. So I came up with this on the fly. Um, by So let's go with, okay, by like mid-July. So post-All-Star break for these at least these first two. Kyle Isbell gets more starts in center field than Michael A. Taylor. MJ Melendez gets more starts at catcher than Salvi. And then this third one, it can be whenever he comes back up to the majors, but Chris Bubich comes back as a reliever. Is this assuming that both Salvi and MAT are in the lineup? So whenever they return from the IL, who gets more starts? Yeah. So I said, but like, oh, I said by post all star break. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Post all star break. So post all star break to the end of the year. Michael a- or uh, Kyle Isbell will get more starts than Michael A. Taylor in center field. Salvi or MJ will get more starts at catcher than Salvi. And whenever Chris Bubich comes back to the majors, he comes back as a reliever. Gotcha. Yeah. I will say the lie is Melendez getting more starts behind the plate. Because I think there's a decent chance Bubich is a reliever. I think there's a decent chance that Isbell does get some run in center against righties. I think Melendez has struggled, and I don't use the word struggling too literally, but Salvi is a rock behind the plate. Mm -hmm. Melendez hasn't been that. I think they will DH Melendez. I think he'll play some outfield. I, I actually think he will play some outfield occasionally. And I think he'll start 40% of the time, 33% of the time behind the plate, but I don't think he'll catch more than Salvi especially with Matheny commenting on what did Matheny say earlier in the year? It was something dumb, but about, Oh, it's going to be hard for Melendez <laughs> to find starts Salvi up here. It's like, that's a dumb thing to say, but that's fine. I mean, the only way Salvi's not behind that plate is if he gets traded, which hell will freeze over three times before Salvi gets traded uh, and, or an in injury, which is more likely and not even, you know, not even that hard to imagine, obviously, because he is now, but the the only way he gets more starts than Salvi, especially behind the plate, is uh, is very very tough to see a road to it. So I, I was the one who kind of brought up Isbell potentially having more PAs in the beginning of the year than Michael A. Taylor. So I I can already kind of envision that kind of happening already right before Michael A. Taylor went down. There was already kind of a little bit of a platoon going there, mm-hmm. but uh, since the injury, he's definitely been able to uh, to show what he's able to do, which is apparently hit the ball really hard right at people. So. It's uh, it's certainly something promising that we can see that we can't really say about Michael A. Taylor on that front. And obviously, I think Bubich might be a reliever long term on mop up duty as a swing man too than I can between Melendez behind the plate. I am very intrigued at the thought of Bo- reliever Chris Bubich. Yeah, because you add in like you think about the funk that he of his delivery. It's very obvious at this point that he really can't repeat it for six innings. But if you ask him to go out, hey. 
blow it out for one inning and throw the ball with some conviction. He was on 97. 97. He had 97 against Texas. Yeah. You go, go get him to blow it out for one inning at 95 to 97 with that delivery and the deception he creates with some decent break secondary offerings. That's a really good sixth, seventh inning guy that mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm actually a, a fan of that. I like Chris Bubich there out of, for one inning, then trying to then let him go out and throw 90 to 92 for six <laughs> you mean four and a half two, or two thirds of an inning yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> while we're yep. briefly talking about kyle isbell can i read you guys something yeah go for it yes please kyle isbell right now in he's got about the same amount of innings 60 plus in both center and right field his uzr so his ultimate zone rating 150 is basically it's on a per inning basis instead of total like just bear with me in center field negative 12.3 in right field is 43.1 yeah. he has negative two defensive runs saved in center two defensive runs saved in right now what i want to do is i'm going to go i'm going to lower this the innings down on fan graphs to 60 and i forgot to pull this up so i apologize for for rambling a minute here if you lower the minimum innings down to 60 in right field, the let's go to UZR 150 and sort his 43.1 rating and his UZR 150 is double that of second place, Brett Phillips. So according to <laughs> ultimate zone rating over 150, so over 150 innings. What is his ultimate zone rating like average out to be? So it's a rate stat is double that almost of yeah. the second best right fielder in baseball. He in center field, if you again with the 60 innings mark and we sort opposite backwards, he is the 11th worst defender in center out of 53 qualified defenders so joel brings up a good point he says where's he gonna play this is exactly what we talked about with kyle isbell as he was coming up yep. elite defender in right field great jumps good routes good speed mm -hmm. good defender can hold it down in center field maybe not gonna be that great at it and that is literally what we've seen he has been to a t exactly what everybody thought he was gonna be except for mike matheny Mike Matheny is the only guy who couldn't get on board with Kyle Isbell from day one. And now we are seeing the fruits of his work paying off. I, I am a Kyle Isbell stan. I, I love what he has done. I love the work he's put in in right field. I love what he's done offensively. I'm glad Joel brought him up. Okay, Joel. Notice, uh, notice how much better he's been since he got, you know, everyday run in the lineup. Kind of, mm. huh? It's, it's so almost funny, like when you give a guy that's pretty good – Every day at bats, consistent, you know, run. It's almost like he's pretty good. Yeah. Sure. I got, I got more to say on. Concept. I got more to say on this topic later when we talk like specifically on big league club. Okay. Joel, hit us with your second one. I didn't have a second one because I thought we were doing one each. So blue falcon <laughs> on my part. Uh, let's just get it. Let's just go into the minor league minute. We got a lot to cover in Columbia. Well, before we get to the minute, um, one thing I want to do really quick is two prospects each that have surprised us. And so it's one arm, one bat. My arm that has surprised me this year is Colin Snyder. Now, I know he's in the big leagues, but we said prospect. So Colin Snyder, his strikeouts, his walk, his batting average against, his batting average on balls in play. Every number you can look at right now in the big leagues is about the same as when he was in AAA, but the home runs are way down. He is avoiding the big hit, giving up extra base hits. And that's the one thing I said uh, with Snyder coming into the season is I, the reason I didn't buy him is I compared him a little bit to Brandon Maurer where he just gets hammered because his fastball doesn't have the necessary attributes to blow by big league hitters. And that's what we saw in Omaha, two, two and a half home runs per nine innings pitched. I mean, he was getting slaughtered. At, with at AAA with the super happy fun ball. Maybe it's because they're playing with the less happy sad ball in the big leagues. I don't know what's going on. The home runs are way down, and Colin Snyder all of a sudden is a super effective 
big league reliever getting ground balls. So Colin Snyder has impressed has, has impressed me so far. Although I think like the the narrative around him is that he's been better than he really has been, but still he's been way better than I thought he would be. The hitter who surprised me is Logan Porter. And mm. he brings up an interesting conversation we'll get to when we get to the double A in the minute. But when do these guys start becoming prospects? He's yep. 26 years old. He's in double A, but he's hit everywhere he's been. He yep. has right now a walk to strikeout ratio uh, over 0.6, right about two thirds. His swing strike rate is between Rivertown and Vinny Pasquantino at 9.8%. And a 139 weighted runs created plus, which is the third best mark in the entire Royal system. When does a guy like Logan Porter become a prospect? Because I watch him hit and it's like, man, there's good juice in a simple swing. He's short. He's compact to the ball. Doesn't swing and miss. He has a good approach and he can drive the ball pretty well. When, when does that guy start to enter our top 50? And I think he will be on our top 50 by, by mid season, just as a, Maybe he's the 50th ranked prospect where if he's the fourth catcher in your organization, you have Melendez, Salvi, Rivero, and then the next guy is Logan Porter in Omaha. You could do worse. You could do worse than a guy like that. Maybe, I mean, Nick Denny got a cup of tea in the big leagues. Maybe Logan Porter gets a cup of tea at some point. So I don't know what the deal with Logan Porter is. I don't know how to evaluate guys like him. But he has been outstanding. He has impressed the hell out of me, and he's put me in a position where – I really think we're going to have to rank him in some capacity at midseason because he won't stop hitting. Like you always <laughs> wait for guys like that to like you wait for the other shoe to drop. With Frank Schwindel, we saw it. He swings entirely too much. Logan Porter doesn't. I don't know if you're just looking for a metric to point at. Like with Frank Schwindel, it was always there. You could point at it and go, that's the reason he won't succeed. It's Logan Porter's age. It's because he's 26 already. He's 26 yeah. in double A. Is that the reason? Like, you hate to rule a guy out because of that, but, I mean, what else do you have? So, Logan Porter's impressed me. I'm uh, He's got my attention. That was – I was looking at Logan Porter as for sure, and I had a lot of good things to say to him last week, but we didn't get to talk about him. But, yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things that you're asking the question, like, when, is they, when do they become, become a prospect? But the other question, the other side of that coin, is when do they stop being considered as a prospect? We always talked about, what, like, Nick Heath was kind of that way was he kind of came into form and started doing the great things he did at 25, 26 years old. So we had plenty of conversation in our chat as his prospect, uh, uh, you know, eligibility. It's at that point, but uh, definitely a Logan Porter fan in in this guy here. And his Twitter handle is at Porter, the real Porter, Porter potty, something like that. So man after my own heart for sure already. (laughs) Uh, the other guy I was going with, uh, that I decided to go a different way was Dylan Shrum, 24 years old at high a, which I understand it's uh, still a lot to prove to be able to be considered a prospect, but he is second in the organization with 154 WRC plus slashing 243. Wait, let me finish 396 and a 514 slug. He is almost on base at a 400 clip. That BABIP is at a 304 too. So it's kind of a, you know, a reliable sample size as well. He entered the season kind of as a non-prospect. He has a 17.7 walk rate and a 27.1% K rate. He sees pitches. He is the prototype guy that loves to see pitches. And I love to see him because he also hits massive dingers. So he'll probably he should be getting dong. massive dongs. Uh, probably should be getting promoted soon once a pair of uh, pro- first base pro- prospects get promoted. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, I think he'll be able to jump aboard and kind of start skyrocketing up the uh, the rankings here pretty quickly from what he's shown there in uh, Quad Cities. My arm is our boy, Noah Cameron, absolutely shoving in Columbia. And then he makes his debut in Quad Cities this last Saturday where he struck out 12 dudes in four innings uh gave up you know two run runs of three hits no big deal but still 12 strikeouts is nothing to bat an eye out so leads the organization in x fit at 262 he's third in whip among starting starting pitchers at 106 second in k percent among starting pitcher starting pitchers third in swinging strike rate at 99 or 19.7 so in an organization with a uh, huge depth in kansas city at the, especially at the positioning of pitcher He's going to get a little less shine than all the big names guys are, but he's 22 years old, uh, got a left-handed arm, 
So he's going to be a little bit more valued. And in any other organization, he would get a lot more hype. But in this one, you're probably talking about maybe in the top 10 of starting pitchers alone. So I think he needs to get more shine. He's obviously going to prove it, keep proving it in quad cities. And hopefully we'll see him maybe in Northwest Arkansas by the end of the year. So Noah Cameron, super uh, impressive what he's done so far. I wrote about Noah Cameron in a 2021 draft recap today. And I mentioned that the Royals have done a great job of accumulating these soft er throwing lefties with great yep. off speed and great pitch ability. And that eventually, if you just keep throwing them at the wall, one is bound to stick. <laughs> Chris Bubich, Drew Parrish, Tyson Guerrero, AJ Block, who is hurt, but same principle. Can we call Noah Foster Cameron. Griffin? Can he can he be in that? Foster group? Griffin. If you keep throwing them at the wall, one of them will work. Right. Mm -hmm. And they've done a great job of maximizing the ability of all these guys. And I just, Noah Cameron's another example. Drew Parrish might be the best example of that. Yeah. Drew Parrish, not a high round pick. Drew Parrish came in. Anthony Veneciano was that way, only they made Veneciano throw 100. So he, like Veneciano, worked himself <laughs> out of this conversation, but he was amongst that. Right. So, like, maybe Parrish and Veneciano are the examples. But again, you get a guy like Noah Cameron, you start to maximize his ability on the mound and let the raw stuff decide whether he makes it. One of them has to stick. And so hmm. just keep throwing them out there because they've they've done a great job of finding the right guys to put in that position. And we talked about it a couple of times where those dudes with those big hooks have to be able to throw up in the zone. And if he's proven anything, especially in this last like two or three week span, that he can live up there with that 90 to 92 mile an hour fastball and then just dive on that changeup and that curveball. He was just striking dudes out left and right. Quad cities living off of that. And then that change just hitting that, you know, hitting that outside corner, especially on righties, was just bonkers. So I his ability to live up in the zone allows him to be able to pitch that curveball as well. And I I mean, I'd just love to see it. Joel, go ahead. All right, so my pitcher is Christian Chamberlain. Especially mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks, he has cut down on the walks significantly, 29 strikeouts to eight walks in his last 14 in the third. There's a big league reliever in there somewhere. Um, you know, For being undersized, you can run it up into the mid to upper 90s. Really good curveball, works in a nice changeup. I, I didn't know what his role was going to be, and I think that's why I was kind of you know, not out on him, but like I just didn't know coming into the year, especially because he got hurt last year. But this year, when he's been healthy, two to three inning stints, you know, it's kind of a long reliever. He's been really good. So I think, especially now that the strikeouts have come and he's not walking the world. So certainly <laughs> something there. And we shouldn't be shocked by this guy. I shouldn't be shocked by this guy. Tucker Bradley just keeps getting hitting. Like, he just does. And, like, it, it's just remarkable, right? Like, there is something to be said for just being a professional hitter, right? And he just keeps doing it. And he did it last year in Quad Cities. He's doing it this year in uh, in Northwest Arkansas. I believe his OPS is up to 870 now, if I have that right. Or 894. I'm sorry. I'm shortchanging yeah. him. And the power's starting to come for him a little bit too. He, I don't know what the big league profile for him is, but that dude just knows how to hit. And, you know, at a certain point, you just got to tip your cap and just go, hey, man, just keep doing your thing. Professional hitter. Like, he, he doesn't – what I appreciate about guys like that is he doesn't try and change who he is. Like, he's not trying to sell out for power. He's not trying to, you know, he's not willing to sacrifice, you know, some strikeouts for some power. Like, he's just going to stay in his approach, go gap to gap, and if he runs into one, then he's going to go bridge. And that's what he's done all year long in Northwest Arkansas. We're going to get to him in a minute. He's my player of the week. So, there's a little foreshadowing. That dude, again, with Logan Porter, when do these guys start becoming legitimate prospects? I know we've had Bradley ranked, but right around 30, when do, when, when do they become legitimate prospects? So we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, really quick, before we get into the minor league minute, let's let's finish up our shenanigans, and then we'll get into the minor league minute. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to do today for some shenanigans is at the beginning of the year, we drafted <laughs> leaders in, in individual like statistical categories, and I want to catch up. I want to recap how we drafted it, just kind of mention it real quick, and then we'll get into the minute. We'll actually recap real baseball that actually happened. So – in the hits category, we took – Josh had Michael Massey, Joel had Nick Lofton, I had Tucker Bradley. Right now, Michael, Michael Garcia leads with 46 hits. Michael Massey is second with 44. Nick Lofton is third with 40th. 
and Tucker Bradley is down there at 10th with 31. When I drafted Tucker Bradley, I knew the caveat would be that the Royals want him to bat ninth for some reason, and he doesn't play every day, so that's killing me right now. But he has been very good. He hits. He's hitting 310, second best batting average in that group come to Michael Garcia. So right now it looks like the best chance is Josh and Joel to win that, but Michael Garcia is going to give you guys a run for their money. In home runs, my guy is letting me down. Suli Matias has <laughs> just five home runs. I think I said he would lead minor league baseball in home runs if he was healthy. He's been healthy. He only has five home runs, so whatever. But right after me, Joel took Michael Massey. Michael Massey has seven. He's in third. Josh took Nick Prado. He is also in third with seven. That's going to be – because we, we said these are only minor league stats for this one. That's yep. going to that's gonna get you. So the only person with a shot, I think, is Joel. But if Sully can get hot, I maybe I've got a shot there. So That's not too bad. See. I mean, Vinny's probably going to graduate too, so – yeah, that's true. And Cam Williams has like eight randomly. So, yeah, what what a, what what's going on there? Uh, Cam Williams hits stupid bombs. Like, I mean, stupid batted ball data. He's on fire too, and he has like a fifty percent K rate. So it's yeah. like you talk about selling out for power. <laughs> he's either going to hit a home run or strike out. There's really not a lot of in between there. So, uh, the OPS leaders. Let me see if I can. How fast I can pull these up. OPS leaders, Vinny is in first place. Joel, you have Vinny uh, for, for OPS. I drafted Kale Emshoff, who is like not even on the board. Kale Emshoff has a 712 OPS. He struggled a little bit in high A. Josh, who do you have there? Prado, again. I got Prado get at 811. Up. Yep. Probably not going to get you anything there. Walk Strikeout to walk ratio. I think Daryl, oh no, Yvonne Castillo. Oh, come yep. on. The new guy. <laughs> <laughs> God Almighty, the new guy's getting me. Well, he's I have the new Alcides Escobar, man. He can he's, yeah. he's Alcides Escobar if Alcides could draw a walk. Man, so me and I Joel has Michael Garcia. He's got a one, even one. Daryl Collins, one point zero nine, is second to Yvonne Castillo. So we'll see about that. Stolen bases. Tyler Tolbert is trying to run away with it. Diego Hernandez won't let him. Tyler Tolbert has 18. Diego Hernandez has 14. Josh Brewer Hicklin has 10. So Joel's going to run away with that one. But Diego Hernandez, my pick there, right after Joel, uh, giving him a run for his money there in second place. On the pitching side, I don't want to talk about this. The ERA leaders, Drew Parrish, <laughs> 1.85, is right there in the running. Let's go, Drew. Let's go, Drew. 1.85, second to Jose Quas and Foster Griffin. We'll probably end up getting rid of Quas. So uh, Parrish has to catch Foster Griffin. Joel, Asa Lacey, not good. Josh, Will Klein, not good. Of Both of those guys have been hurt. So I am the only one with a prayer. And if Drew Parrish gets promoted out of double A, none of us are going to be eligible to win this category, <laughs> which is kind of funny at the moment. If we Will go to Klein strikeouts, has the worst ERA in the system currently. <laughs> yeah. Noah Cameron is doing his best to channel his inner Chris Bubich and lead minor league baseball in strikeouts. He's mm -hmm. currently got 51. I've got Veneciano. He's not close. Joel is the only one with a chance here with Alec Marsh, unless Ace Lacey comes back and is healthy. But it looks like Will Marsh is the only, I'm sorry, Alec Marsh is the only one who can run down Noah Cameron at the moment. And Joel's got him. Uh, and strikeout to walk ratio. I've got Herbert Garcia. Herbert Garcia is in ninth. Joel has Drew Parrish. He is in 11th. Josh has Angel Zerpa not on the board. So <laughs> when I when I asked at the beginning of the year, I was like, do we want to do the leader amongst the three of us? And both these guys are like, no, you got to actually lead it. Nobody's going to catch anybody in front of us in that one so that's josh that's a die is leading at an eight yeah josh die <laughs> who by the way mlb pipeline put in their top 30 i don't oh, know nice. all that noise but whatever interesting grand ball rate i have luinda avila he is 15th josh has anderson paulino he's in fourth yeah a got a shot down the leader joel has frank mazzucato who we have not seen enough of yet Jose Quas currently leading 66%. Noah Murdoch, Ryland Kaufman also up there. 
Number, number four, Anderson Paulino, 61-6. So, Josh, you got a shot there. Swing strike rate, maybe the most important of all of these categories. I have Asa Lacey, again, hurt, not on the board anyway. I doesn't even have 10 innings, so whatever, Asa. Joel has Will Klein, also not on the board. Josh has Anthony Veneciano. Why did none of us pick Alec Marsh for this category? I don't know. But he, Noah Cameron, and Casey Kalich running away with a swinging strike category there. So I thought it'd be fun to pick up on kind of where we left off into that. Maybe it wasn't that fun because we're not doing very well. Shows what we <laughs> end up knowing. But hey, some of these older guys, like it's hard to – it's hard, to, it's hard to account for some of the minor league veterans that are in there. So that is that. <sighs> okay. Any thoughts before we get in the minute? Let's do it. I'm bad at that game. That's my thought. Oh, we're recording during the Diamondbacks um, Royals game right now, and the Royals had three home runs in the first inning. So that's cool. They did yep. what? When Merrifield no, no. went off the game with one, Bobby hit one, and Hunter Dozier hit one. All of Zach Davies, which if you heard of that story, you hate to see it. <laughs> what is Zach? Also, ru- the Zach runners Dav- on the corner. Zach- sorry about Zach out. Davies. What go, happened? Go, go, go look it up. Just, just look it up after the show. Okay. I will. There Carlos goes. Santana has a hit, of course. <clears throat> yeah, MJ Melendez walks. My God. Yeah, Zach Davies not having a banner night. He has one out. He's given up three home runs. Did I ever tell you guys about the very first high school start I ever made? No. Freshman year, we were playing at home, and our the guy who is now our head basketball coach was the JV coach at the time, and he is a phenomenal dude. I love the guy. So my very first varsity – or not varsity, my very first high school start. We're at home. We're playing our crosstown rival – First guy I hit, the second guy got a hit, and the third guy uh, or third baseman made an error. So the bases are loaded. Our crosstown rival guy comes up, hits a grand slam. I've got no outs. My The head coach comes walking out to the mound real slow, and they send a guy out to the bullpen, standard operating procedure. And he looks at me, and he goes, will you slow down? I was like, what? And he goes, He's like, slow down. The game's going to be over before I can get anybody else warm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. We ended, up winning a moment. we ended up winning that game, but that is the funniest thing a coach has ever said to me in the middle of a game. He said, will you just slow down? He's like, if you're going to get hit, at least give me time to get somebody else warm. That was funny. Um, yeah. That's, that's Zach Davies right now, so. Mm-hmm. Let's get into the minor league minute. The minor league minute brought to us by Drum Farm this year. Drum Farm Center for Children is a foster care facility on Lee Summit Road in Lee Summit, Missouri. They do a wonderful job providing housing and activities. They have an actual farm there on campus. They sell fresh produce. They have life skills that the kids go through. They have a compass program for kids who have aged out of the foster care system so they can come back and have somewhere to live and, and people to raise and look after them after they've aged out. So Drum Farm Center for Children in Lee Summit, Missouri, picking up the minor league minute this year. They're, they're some friends of Drum Farm are picking up the minor league minute for Drum Farm this year. So I feel like at some point we needed to talk about that, that we're not taking money from a charity where somebody is promoting them, <laughs> helping them with advertisement money via the podcast. So, I felt like at some point we needed to bring that up. But yeah, anyway, Drum Farm has the Minor League Minute this year. Big thanks to them and their sponsors for the Minor League Minute. As always, we're going to start in Columbia. I wanted to save the best for last. We're starting in Columbia like we always do. Frank Mazzucato, dealt. Ben Caderna, dealt. Shane Panzini, pitching on Wednesday. That Myrtle Beach Club is a murderer's row for low A baseball. And Frank Mazzucato and Ben Caderna shoved it right where the sun don't shine and handed it to the Myrtle beach Pelicans. That was as impressive of a, as a professional debut as you could have asked for those two. Frank Mazzucato's changeup. I, the camera angle is so bad in Columbia in terms of yeah. like evaluating pitchers. I couldn't tell if his changeup was actually cutting, but it looked like it had like cut to it. Like, I don't know if it was actually cutting, but it had good movement either way. It certainly was not straight. Uh, so, Frank Mazzucato's changeup looked good. The curveball, as advertised. Fastball running up to 95. Whoever was working with Frank Mazzucato in Arizona 
hats off to you. He looked awesome. The pitchability. I mean, everything they sold us for Frank Mazzucato was as advertised. Yep. The changeup was better. The velocity was better. If he keeps on this track, top 100 prospect. Ben Kaderna, 95 as well. I didn't get his max velo, but he has the ability to go 97. So we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on his velocity. But pitching into the upper nine, mid, mid to upper 90s, his slider slash curveball, I actually did get some confirmation. It is, it is a slider that is manipulated into more of a slurve at certain times. So I mentioned on hmm. Twitter, the catcher's putting down a two and a three. Same pitch, different grip to, to get a little bit of a bigger uh, break. Uh, at certain times to play it more like a curveball. So that's that. And then the changeup. Oh my gosh. He did not have that when he was drafted. I don't know where that came from. The Royals have not been able to teach other pitchers changeups like that. That it was insane. It looked like yeah. a legitimate Jackson Coar offering. Like, yes. Like one of a good Jackson Coar offering. Like I was blown away by Ben Kudernut. And again, Frank Mazzucato was about as advertised. I didn't really know what to expect from Kuderna other than loud stuff. He looked like he was in full control of the game, like a, like a seasoned mm-hmm. veteran. Mm-hmm. I just, I yep. could not have been more impressed and I cannot wait. We haven't actually talked about these two yet in depth. Joel, I want to get your thoughts on, on the two youngsters. I was floored. Could we have expected them to be any better? No, I don't think so. And one, one of the things that I wanted to see was not only the velocity, but, how you handle adversity in game. First pitch of the game, Pete Crow Armstrong gets a single. Like, for, congrats, welcome to pro ball. You got a runner on base. <laughs> Strikes out the next batter with an elevated fastball. Like, that That to me, when I saw that, I was like, okay, yeah, okay. I, I, I think he's going to be just fine. The three walks, but he worked around them. No, no major damage, none of that. Still managed to get three strikeouts. The curveball is stupid. And I don't know, like, I agree with you. I don't know if he was cutting his changeup. Even, and if he's not, he's confident to throw his changeup glove side, which as someone that, you know, I played, you know, I played baseball. I was a lefty and I had a really hard time spotting my changeup glove side. That was something I always could not do into righties. If he can do that now, my goodness. And then the fact that Kuderna, I didn't know he threw a changeup. I didn't know he had that in the, in the, in the chamber. And the fact that he was throwing it in leverage counts for outs against righties. Yep. Yeah. Go, go righty, righty. And not just a here, like the way Jackson Coar would throw his curveball in the minors. I'm just like, here it is. You know, he's actually, or the way Brady Singer would throw his change up for a while. You no, know, he's actually throwing it like one, two to try and get an out. And he did. And he was getting swings and misses. It was so impressive. And now I can't wait to see what Shane Panzini does. Because there's a dude that's going to run it up into the in the upper 90s like uh, Kuder Nakan with an absolute whammer of curveball. So this is going to be a lot of fun. The, this Fireflies team is about to get really fun. Joel, you mentioned a couple weeks ago about that feeling of vindication. I mm-hmm. tried to tell folks to relax a little bit on the pitching development side of things because I think we're going to see it this year in Columbia, and I think we saw it on Sunday with Kudernis changeup. That was like that is the example that we're talking about of let's let's see what they can do with the young guys. Like it hasn't translated to the upper levels yet. It needs to quickly. But what they're doing with the kids is is fun. I'm mm-hmm. I'm a big fan, and like let's let's temper expectations a little bit. But, but I mean, would it shock anybody if they're both top eighty prospects in baseball by midseason? No, not at all. And also, I think Kudrin will look damn good in that Chicharro on this uniform. Like that was <laughs> nice. Yeah, the the uniform combo there, where the other the Myrtle Beach was wearing white on gray. Like the gray on white, white on gray didn't look good, but the Chicharrones jerseys. Did you see the black ones on Sunday? Oh yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, I in that, that Columbia hat. rotation that still yeah. is Eric Sarantola, who I have not been giving enough credit. He's nasty. Like controls an issue, but jo- Josh, really quick, I want to get your thoughts on the the two starters, but just Columbia in general. I mean, it, it, they're going to be – I mean, you get the Noah Cameron graduation and you get to fill it up with Mazzucato and Kurdina. And they both dazzled in their debuts, like you've kind of said. But it's – I don't really have much more. The expectations, like I said last time, they weren't really there for me. I was just anxious to kind of see them. It did seem like Mazzucato was overthrowing a little bit. Uh, he was missing super high on some of those fastballs. But that could also uh, just be part of, like, setting them up for that hammer curve, which, again – 
Chef's kiss, love it. Uh, I did get a reading on Kuderna. The only time I heard anything about a mile per hour of either on him was around pitch forty. Was was ninety three miles an hour. So that uh, usually somewhere in the mid to upper nineties, he was hitting about ninety three with at pitch forty. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep an eye on that for sure. It'll always be a long running thing with those dudes. But yeah, they're going to be appointment television. They've already had uh, Eric Pena there, who's shown that he's not necessarily worthy of that appointment television, but now we've got more of a reason to watch Columbia. I'm excited to see how they kind of pan out. Plus how, like you guys said, that was your debut and you get to wear that Chicharrones uniform. That's, that's like a cherry on top of the whole shebang of bang. That was a beautiful Jersey. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to pull up river town stats really quick. I don't know why fan I got them to me sometimes. Do you but- want the year? Yeah, just give us or give us River Town's the, yearly line. I got the the last week was a nine twenty six OPS with three walks, four strikeouts, and a stolen base. And he's up top. I got that's the standard. He is. 247 hitting 247 with a 383 OBP and a 515 slug. Good for a 899 OPS on the year. What's his weighted runs created plus for the year? Because it's like the second best mark in the entire 148. 148? Yeah. Jeez. He's got the second best weighted runs created plus in the organization. Like Mm. he's he is giving you reasons to watch that Columbia team and what was he a 14th round pick last year? So I wanted to give a shout out to Real Town River Town real quick. A for yep. the 80 grade name. B that dude just just won't stop hitting. So he's been he's been fun to watch. We're gonna buzz through High A really quick. That team's can be boring to watch. Josh, your guy Tyler Gentry, has been really good. Luca mm-hmm. Tresh has been good. He struggled of late. Ryland Kaufman gets promoted. Looks about as advertised. Struggled with control a little bit. Got hit a little bit. Lots of strikeouts. Struck out Joey Votto for his first high A um, at bat. That was, That's that was a nice little cool. trophy. And by the nice way, feather in the cap. he was 93-94 on the corner and then threw a hammer of a curveball and got Joey Votto. Like, that was, that was a spectacular part of his high A debut. I want to move pretty quickly here to double A. Michael Garcia and Michael Massey are raking. The Royals have more middle infielders than they know what to do with at the moment. It is, it is phenomenal to watch. And at some point, the conversation that I didn't put in the notes that I sent you because I wanted to get your raw takes on this and and you know pretty quickly here, somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to be traded. They can't afford to just sit on all of these guys. You can't platoon everybody. Now, maybe you can platoon a Lofton and a Massey. Maybe you can platoon a Wit and an Isbell. I mean, there's there's an extent, but you can't keep all these guys. You have to start moving somebody at their peak value while you have the depth. Josh, really quickly, of Massey, Lofton, Garcia, who do you think is the most likely to be traded and why? And again, here, just pretty quick. Uh, I would probably say Massey, um, just because he's the closest to the major leagues, and I feel like there's, you know, they're building that next wave prior to this wave, so it makes sense that Garcia sticks around. And I think, I mean, Lofton seems to be doing okay in center field, so it kind of makes more sense to me to keep him around to see if he's a actual, you know, solid center fielder that can hit really well like he can. So I would say Massey out of that group. Joel, yeah, I'd say Massey, which sucks because I really think that that could be your second baseman of the future, especially with the way that Nicky Lopez has regressed this year pretty hard. Something to consider there that maybe that's the, that's the move at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think lo- the Royals like Lofton's positional versatility too much. And they have Michael Garcia already on the 40. So they believe in him a lot. And so I don't think they would move him. So I think Massey ends up being the odd one out here, even though I think he might be the best player of the three. That's my thoughts exactly. So I'm glad we're on the same page. Um, <laughs> Will Klein has struggled. Veneciano has been kind of meh. If they can get that rotation right, that double A team will be a force to be reckoned with. Yeah. Up in Omaha, our MVP of the week. Finally, boys, we've finally gotten a week where he is. We get the to MVP. talk about him. 
the Italian breakfast, the Italian nightmare, the great Pasquantino, <laughs> Vinny Pasquantino, hit 317 last week, an OPS of 1.319, 235 weighted runs created plus, two home runs, five doubles. There is nothing left for this man at Omaha. You talk about guys that could be <laughs> traded. I didn't want to do it. They did this with Will Myers. Mm. They let him yep. sit in Omaha. They let him rake, and then they traded him. I do, I didn't want to go here. Is it possible that it's Vinny at this point? I mean, you can't ever say no on that, but didn't they let Hosmer absolutely rake in, hot, in, in Omaha too? He had like 400. Well, Before he was in his first stint in Omaha. He was, his first he was in Omaha. at this point. Yeah. He was up at this point in that year where – and, again, he was – by the way, he was 21, not 24. So True, yeah. Like I see what you're saying, and Hosmer wasn't hitting for as much power, but it's like – this This reminds me more of the Will Myers situation where it's like you kind of need yeah. the outfielder back then. You need the first baseman right now, and they will not let him come up. It just – Either A, they really are going to just milk Santana and O'Hearn until they can't milk them no more. Or there's something about Vinny that we're not ready for yet. And that, I mean, imagine if you packaged him and Massey together, you get a hell of a return. Like, I really believe you could get a hell of a return for Pasquantino and Massey. Now, that would break my soul. It would be oh, really man. hard for me to do a podcast that week if they traded both those guys. Like, I don't know what I would talk about, but would it shock you at this point? We, we keep talking about all the bats they got to get in the lineup. I mean, uh, who better? Okay. It would shock me. Cause what like one bat is going to put you over the edge. What one pitcher is going to put you over the edge right now. So why would you trade those guys? I think if, if the Royals were like hovering around 500 right now, and they felt like they were one pitcher away, then sure, I would bite the bullet and do it. But this team is going to lose 90 games. Why trade them now? You're not one pitcher away. You're about three. You're not one bat away. You're like three we're twenty five percent of the way through the season. That's the that's the argument for it, right? It's not. I mean, well, we're not selling on the season in 40 games. Nobody's doing that. Or they shouldn't be. I think the I think the the real reasoning and and finally disagree on something as much as we all agree on everything all the time is like with Will Myers, they didn't want to expose him to a league where they thought he would get hurt, not hurt, but like not he would get exposed. Formed. He would get got. Thank you. Get exposed and lowers trade value. If you keep Vinny in Omaha, if you keep Massey in double a and don't promote them and they just keep hitting their trade value doesn't go down right now. The model's, may not like it as much, but if you're just watching them, you haven't seen them be exposed yet. So maybe that's the reason. That's what that's what that's the fear I have right now. It's like, man, mm. like we've seen them do this before. Like think about the guys they don't hesitate with. Melendez, he's here. He's not going anywhere. They just went and got him. It's like, oh my gosh, like are we really doing this? Like please don't. I just want to watch all of them play in Kansas City at the same time. But at the same time, you can only have nine. So Mm -hmm. We'll circle back to this conversation because Vinny is our MVP of the week. He could not be any hotter at Omaha, and the Royals are like, yeah, we don't care. So <laughs> really quickly, last thing in Omaha, Darren Blanco gets the call over Brewer Hicklin. Really quick, 30-second answer, Joel, is that – does that mean anything to you that Blanco got the call over Hicklin? Not really. I think this was just one of those like, hey, dude, you're 29, come up and get your cup of coffee because – I don't think he's a long-term fourth outfield option. I think that that was just like a kind of a tip of the cap for like grinding for, you know, the last couple of years between double A AA and triple A for him. So I don't, I don't think it means much. I, I think you, they probably, they, for all we know, they could have flipped a coin between Hicklin and Blanco and they probably would have been the same dude. So <laughs> yeah, Josh, that's, that's my say. Ditto. Okay. I think it does. The only thing it means to me is that they're probably not going to let Brewer Hicklin play a lot of center field in the big leagues. So if Brewer Hicklin does get the call at some point, he's going to be Kyle Isbell's platoon in the corners where you get a tough lefty, Hicklin, go hit him. Because Hicklin destroys lefties in his minor league career. But the only thing that I can think of is Brewer Hicklin may not ever get a shot to, to hit against left or to play center field or hit against righties in any capacity in the big league. So uh, just some thoughts I had. 
My player of the week, Tucker Bradley. Tucker Bradley hit 375 with a 1063 OPS. He walked twice as much as he struck out last week. 176 weighted runs created plus and stole two bases. Tucker Bradley is a monster. And I just don't know at what point does he become like a top 20 prospect? At what point does he become a legitimate fourth outfield type? Maybe he's the platoon with Brewer Hicklin. Kyle Isbell plays every day. You platoon somebody like Tucker Bradley with somebody like Brewer Hicklin, lefties and righties, and you go San Francisco Giants on them. So I don't know, but I really liked what Tucker Bradley did this week. We talked about him a lot. I just I cannot get enough of him, and it's funny to me that he always bats ninth and plays not every day. So my pitcher of the week, Ben Kaderna, professional debut, 3.2 innings pitched, five strikeouts. The changeup was gnarly, uh, just one walk, and the only run that scored was on some shenanigans. He lost his control for one batter, that one walk, four straight balls, all glove side, made a quick adjustment to get out of the inning, the only run that scored was some shenanigans. He was dominant for most of that outing. I was thrilled uh, with Ben Kaderna this past week. Joel, player, pitcher of the week. So you stole my player of the week. I had come in locked in. I had done all my research good to go. So you, thank you for that one. Um, but for my pitcher of the week, just because he made his big league debut and I thought he looked good doing it, I'll go with Frank Mazzucato. I'll go with the, the other guy in that rotation in Columbia. Um, you know, the three walks maybe make you go, eh, but – the fact that he made his first career start, I you know I think he would, showed everything of why the Royals took him in the first round, and I can't wait to see what he does as he gets a little more comfortable. Joshua, I like it. I am going pitcher of the week. My guy Drew Parrish uh, had one start, five and two thirds, three hits, no earned, but did give up two runs on two walks and eight strikeouts. So I uh, I, I mean we kind of came into the year hoping that he would be able to. Uh, prove why his uh, kind of double stamp on what he did last year. And it seems like he's able to do that. Mr. Uh, minor league quality start guy. So I'm in on Drew Parrish for sure. The other guy is Tyler Tolbert had a 1043 OPS. Four of his five hits this week were extra base hits. He had four stolen bases and five walks to five strikeouts this week. If he can get on base, he's going to take bases as well. He's an absolute weapon. So Tyler Tolbert's my player of the week. That's a great pick. I love Tyler Tolbert. I just, I really hope he hits. Like, I would love to see that guy get a shot at AAA at some point in his career, being mm-hmm. that he's a step away from the big leagues, because I love that kid. I love watching him play baseball. Really hope he gets um, some run at some point. Okay, really quick, we'll do a, just a couple thoughts. Oh, my God, Zach Granke gave up three runs. Yep, it's 4-3 oh, in the first. Uh, they hit two home runs. My goodness yep. gracious. So five home runs in one inning in that Kansas City game. Good Lord. A far cry from what we've seen <laughs> so far this year. Um, I just I, – I pretty well laid out all my thoughts on the big leagues in the minor league minutes this morning. So I don't have a ton to get into. I mean, do you guys have any meaningful thoughts on the big leagues? Or I I'll, talk about, I'll talk about it later this week. Okay, Josh, go ahead. Um, Friday night is awesome to see all the fans out there. I think there's 27,000 people out at the stadium. You're actually, you know, causing a ruckus trying to get the team in front of them, uh, support them. So that was cool to see. And then Monday morning seemed like the lowest point of the season. So it's very interesting that a, uh, uh, what, three-game series against the Twins can really turn that around. But I I know that we've talked about it a bunch, and you guys have talked about it on one royal way, but this, this playing the kids theory – if you are the one pumping the the helium into this play the kids movement, you don't get to talk about how bad the team is overall because either you're so adamant that bringing up two guys that you have no idea what they're going to do on the big league level is better than what you're currently getting from the guys that you want to be replaced. I get that argument. Fine. But you're obviously like completely selling on the season at that point. And I don't want to hear how pissed off you are about how bad the Royals are when they have, in your theory, in your way of thinking, two completely unknowns are the the one guys you want to bring up. So I don't want to hear any more talk about how bad they are uh, at that point. Uh, The Royals have the third most games played by positional rookies currently. They have the second most inning pitches for pitchers under 25 years old or 25 or under years old. They're letting kids play. They're still bad. So it's just that's part of this whole journey. They're going to be but bad I think if the, the kids the are playing. The two people we're talking about specifically 
yes. are replacing V2 worst players in Major League Baseball. Like, I got you something for that. Okay, so out of these three guys, Santana, Witt, and Salvi, who do you think has the worst F4? Probably Witt. They're tied. They're all at negative point one. So if you're going to talk about Carlos Santana being bad, you also have to talk about Witt and Salvi. You want Salvi? You want Santana's head on a pike? You got to talk about Witt and Salvi too. Next one. I've been Who trying to in, in defense. I've been trying to trade Witt for like five years. So. Everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Who has the lowest WRC plus between Santana, Witt, and Nikki? Nikki. Oh, probably Nikki. Witt is a 51. Nikki at a 68. Santana at a 69. Ain't nobody calling for Nikki's head. Ain't nobody doing it. He's Who one has of the, the lowest. Kids. Uh, well, one nobody's of the talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. Is all my point is. Who has the lowest WRC plus? Oh, uh, did that. Who has the lowest defensive run save between Nikki at second, Melendez at catcher, and Santana at first? Spoiler alert: Nikki has negative six at, se- at second base. Melendez at negative three behind the plate. Nikki Santana Lopez has negative three. six defensive runs saved, according to FanGraphs today. Yes. Uh, not sure. Negative six. Yep. Defensive run save. That's what that was what said. Yeah. And then the finally, who has the lowest UZR per 150 between Santana at first, Bobby Witt Jr. at shortstop, and Isbell at center field? We talked about it. Isbell minus 12.3. Bobby Witt Jr. is at a negative 2.3. Over the weekend, he had a couple big errors. And then Santana's at a positive 3.9. Yes, he plays the easier position, obviously. I'm just saying, these kids are playing, and they are also part of the contributing factor of their pace for 105 losses is all i'm saying and if, if you want to double down and you say this is part of the grinding their teeth i'm giving up on this season great i completely understand your point and you have your opinion and that's fine but to also be complaining about this team being bad you also have to talk about the kids being bad so far too yeah i think the, the rant. i think everybody's pretty well said if you're going to be bad at least be bad and fun like at least yes. be, at least be like- interesting I don't think yeah. anything anything I've said contradicts anything you said. Like the the two guys we want up are replacing two of the worst players, two of the worst old players on the <laughs> team in the league. It's like nothing that you said contradicts. Like I just I just want all the kids to play all the time, and then if they're bad, let it be because the kids are playing. The yeah. the the being bad is frustrating when it's well. I mean Zach Granke's gonna be here. Zach Granke is is not supposed to be a real ace on the team, but yeah. it's it's frustrating when Taylor Clark is blowing the game. It's frustrating when <laughs> when Vinny Pasquantino is our MVP in the minor leagues because they won't call him up. It's frustrating when Ryan O'Hearn is getting at bats. Like nothing that you said is I, I think yeah. contradictory. Like the the let the kids play is stop running out the old guys. Like we don't care if the young guys suck. It sucks when it's old guys sucking because that's that's the frustrating thing is like when you mm-hmm. are playing the veterans, you're playing guys who are not a part of the future and they're the bad ones. So like I understand what you're saying, Santana. If you want to if you want to die on the car, I'm not dying on the hill. I'm just I was you, putting it you, in context. I, I will dig your grave for you. But <laughs> I will pay for the tombstone if you want to die on the Carlos Santana Hill. But Hey, I understand where lot, you're guys. coming from in that he gets a lot of flack. I don't think he'd be getting the same flack if he was 22 making the rookie minimum, sure. not 38 and making $10 million. $10 million. He's like the third highest played, third highest paid player. It's Salvi. It's Granky. Is Santana the third highest paid player on the team this I think year? So, so that's, I mean, Benny's, that's the issue. That only nine or is. something, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So that's I the totally understand. And you know, we're, we're a, I mean, being a farm system podcast. We're partial to wanting the the kids to play. I'm just saying there are people out there that are going to be complaining no matter what, and they can go on get. Yeah, so I'm with you. The final thoughts for the night. I want to ask, like, do you guys remember when they did the blackout at Arrowhead? Mm-mm. No, and I've all the Chiefs fans blackouts. like back in i don't remember what year it was but like they they got a bunch of people to wear black to the game and oh i'm talking remember. about this i had to go look it up but i don't know yeah. what you're talking about yeah but essentially i mean protesting like at what point 
as a fan. The years, right? Yeah. At what point as a fan, like how bad would it have to get for you to boycott the Royals in some capacity? How bad, like how, how close are we and how much worse would it have to get? It would have to be like a month out of first place by the All Star break. It feels like that's that's par for the course. Like, what did you say? How many games out of first place? A month, so thirty games. Whew. It might get got this year. I, I I don't know. I like you said, we're all gluttons for punishment in this situation. I'm not sure I'll ever not watch them. I may not pay closer attention, but. I mean, there's we're too close to the to the tide turning for me to stop now. So they're going to start playing kids in theory, and when that happens, I want to be able to to say I saw MJ Melinda's first home run, Bobby Wood Jr.'s first stolen the base. All these dudes, I want to see them go from not good prospects or good prospects, not good big leaguers to okay big leaguers to where they where they're hitting their ceiling. So I want to be part of that. Fair enough, Josh. Any final thoughts tonight? Are you guys? We got Memorial Day weekend coming up. Are you guys pool guys, lake guys, beach guys? Lake. Me too. Pool, I guess. I don't know. I'm kind of lame. <laughs> no, that's just it having is a what lake it is. is like a giant dirty pool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I'm going to go to a lake, I'm going to sit in the boat on top of a cooler and not get in the water. That's fine. Yeah, that's perfect. It's a, it's a vibe. Joel, As final thoughts. Say. We're running long, so I'll just shut up and we'll get out of here. <laughs> and if you guys want to come to my timeline for hockey takes, I'll start doing that, I guess. I'm a, I'm a, actually a big hockey guy, and Stanley Cup playoffs are the best playoffs. So, oh. The last hockey game I watched was Sidney Crosby scoring. How many goals did he score in Game 7 against the Red Wings a long time ago? Oh, God, and it's, so long ago. By the way, so long ago that the Penguins and the Red Wings now play in the same conference. They can't even play each other in the Stanley <laughs> Cup Finals anymore. Yeah, That's I'm how a, long ago it's been since I've watched a real hockey game. I'm a Penguins fan, and I watched uh, them blow a 3-1 series lead to the New York Rangers last round, so not having a fun time. But now I'm rooting for the Edmonton Oilers because Connor McNavid is the NHL equivalent to Mike Trout, so that's pretty fun to watch. There you go. Find us on Twitter at Royals Farm. We're giving away two tickets to that home opener against the Astros. If Vinny Pasquantino is not in the lineup for that game, or if he, at least if he's not in the big leagues for that game, uh, if you don't win those tickets, go buy your tickets on Tickets for Less. Go watch that home series. They'll be back June 3rd against the Houston Astros. Thanks to Drum Farm. Thanks to KCSE. Thanks to KCSN. Thank you to you, Josh. Thank you to you, Joel. The Royals are winning 5-3. to three. Maybe they won't get blown out tonight. We can it's hope. To right? do. We'll see if they can do it. We'll see you guys again next week. Thanks for joining us tonight.